We're going to dive in deeper than what we did here this morning. Now, uh, for you kids, this, this first part may not be as exciting as some of the things that we're going to cover at 5 o'clock. That part, if you're a third grader, you're going to love it from 5 o'clock on, guaranteed. But we want to dive a little deeper to get into some very interesting, important information when it comes to worldview. Because everybody has a worldview. Everybody is religious. Even an atheist is religious. Uh, you know, I did a debate at Wayne State, and uh, this professor, oh man, he was mad. And uh, an older guy, older gentleman, and he was just shaking angry, just angry. And he said, you know, you shouldn't be here. You're trying to take your, your religion and your faith, and you're trying to put it off as science, and you're confusing these kids. You shouldn't even be here. I'm just waiting for a heart attack. You know, I'm just like three, two. This guy's going to drop. And uh, I said, sir, let me ask you something. I said, this atomic particle that existed that the evolutionists call a singularity, that about 18 to 20 billion years ago, they say, this atomic particle existed, and it blew up into what we call the Big Bang. And I said, let me ask you, I said, this singularity, this atomic particle that existed, what do scientists say at this point where that singularity came from? He said, we don't know. I said, so at this point, science has no explanation for where this atomic particle came from? He said, no. I said, so what you're telling me then is you have to believe that it existed by faith. Yes. I mean, I was like, three, two, he is going, okay? But he admitted it, and I give him credit for that. You see, this is what we call logic. Logic shows us that you either believe in eternal God or eternal matter. Both can't be. The problem is eternal matter, believing that this atomic particle always existed, goes against laws of science. Laws that are there, that all of science operates under, but yet in order for that to be true, you have to break the law. This is what we call an inconsistency. Now, maybe some of you are evolutionists here, okay? I'm going to be up front. I don't want to sneak up on you. I don't want to, you know, hey, well, this is what, you know. I believe the earth is only about 6,000 years old. You can mock me. You can laugh. And you can think, oh, that's ridiculous. But I just ask that you hear me out. I have not found any science yet that disagrees with what I believe. I don't care if it's chemistry, whether it's biology, whether it's geology, it doesn't make any difference. It all supports exactly what my worldview is. And this is the fault of evidence. We'll talk about this more, but evidence is always interpreted by our worldview. And so I'm not here to be able to, you know, to, to prove you wrong. Okay? If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, great. I'm not saying you're going to hell and you're not a Christian because you don't believe the way I do. But what I'm hoping to show you today is this that whatever we believe, whatever our worldview is, needs to be consistent with the world around us. Okay, It needs to be consistent with what we practice in our everyday lives. And the only way to remain consistent is to stand on the Word of God without cutting it up and moving it around and reinterpreting it. It's the only way to be consistent, and you'll see and understand that as we go throughout the day. You see, if you're going to believe in that atomic particle, you break laws of science like the first and second law of thermodynamics to believe that it existed. And I'm not going to get into that and bore you with those details right now. Uh, another example, the origin of life. Where did life come from? How many of you saw the... the uh, DVD Expelled, or the movie when it was out. It was a documentary. Okay, Wow, only that. You guys need to get and watch Expelled. It is fantastic. Ben Stein, uh, he did this documentary on creation and teaching creation and whatnot. You need to see, because he keeps asking them, where did life come from? And he goes to Richard Dawkins and all these other famous evolutionists of today, Hawkins and others, and they cannot answer where life came from. Why? because it breaks the laws of science. We have a law called biogenesis. It's in our textbooks. Every secular school is going to teach you the law of biogenesis, which says life 
cannot come from non-life. And then three pages later they say, but it happened. How? We can't get it. You know, well, on the backs of crystals, well, here's a crystal. It formed in water. Here's a bottle of water. Take it back to your lab. Get me some life. But they can't. Because it's a law of science, which means everything we have observed follows this law. But yet they're saying that billions of years ago, life came about. Yet they can't explain why, but they demand that we teach it. That's inconsistencies. All kinds of inconsistencies. You know, it's funny to me that you can go to Richard Dawkins, and he will make it his very purpose in life to tell you that you have no purpose in life. That's an inconsistency, isn't it? They're going to tell you that, you know, you're the most special thing in the world. Their kids are the most special thing in the world, yet they, you know, go to school, they'll go home and hug their kids as something special, but then they teach you at school that you're just an earthworm, right, that you came from scum. That's an inconsistency. If we're going to live a consistent world according to evolution, I think we ought to get rid of hospitals. I mean, if the survival of the fittest, and we want the fittest to survive, I don't want those dumb snowboarders who can't avoid the trees to pass their genes on. I mean, if you can't stay away from the ho-hos and the ding-dongs, then I don't want your genes passed on. We ought to just let you die, shouldn't we? I mean, if we're going to be consistent, and unfortunately, many out there are proposing that we be consistent with the teachings of evolution. And, and there, I even saw on our local news channel not too many years back where they were saying, women, if your husbands cheat on you, don't get so upset. That's natural. It's just evolution. I mean, that's how it goes. And so it's natural for men to, to cheat on their wives. But these are the kind of things that they promote. Adolf Hitler loved Charles Darwin. He used Darwin as his means of trying to get rid of the inferior race. Now, by the way, they're not inferior. But that's what evolution teaches, isn't it? That some races are inferior than, uh, than others. Matter of fact, we often hear about Darwin's book, Origin of Species, but that wasn't the full title of his book. Origin of Species by Natural Selection and the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. That's the title of his book. Favored Races? Which ones are the favored races? And so it's not politically correct in our country to talk about favored races. But in other countries it is. The Aborigines, they used to be run off of cliffs like buffalo. Do you know that in the Chicago Museum and others, we have, there are actually skulls of Aborigine people because they used to be studied as animals, form of a missing link of evolution. This is what evolution brings us, and it is filled with inconsistencies. You see, a worldview here is a network of presuppositions that are untested by science through which all experience is interpreted, and frankly, it is untestable. Like I said, everybody has a worldview. Now, what I think is interesting is the Bible tells us that we need to have a biblical worldview if you're going to come to, to truth. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you do not have a fear of the Lord, how are you going to find wisdom? You see, I believe that there are many fools at, at Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Why? Because the Bible says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. You see, you can get all kinds of knowledge. You can learn your ABCs and one, two, threes. However, Without the fear of the Lord, you will not have the wisdom to apply those ABCs to life in a wise way. You won't know what to do with that knowledge. You will take that knowledge and you will turn it into foolishness. And I believe that's what's happened in our country. We've taken knowledge, many of these, uh, these evidences that we see all around us from science, and we've turned them into foolishness and thinking that there could be life on outer space planets. We'll talk about, touch on that a little later. We've turned it into thinking that we came, you know, goo turned into zoo, which then turned into you. That's foolishness. We don't know what to do with the knowledge. 
because we don't have the fear of the Lord. And so I stand up here unapologetically to say that my worldview is a biblical one. And so if you're here hoping just to hear science without the Bible, I'm sorry, I can't. Because all of the science is going to be interpreted through my worldview. Has to be. And that is really what we're going to talk about here. We see in Colossians, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want wisdom? You want knowledge? I can promise you one thing. You will never find it apart from Christ. Because only in Christ will these things be found. And, and I, I get this. I used to be blind. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Guys, evolution is one of these things that is one of these deceptions, the traditions of men. It is not scientific. I can give any of you a quarter million dollars for one scientific evidence of true evolution taking place. What we call macroevolution, a dinosaur turning into a bird, whatever. Human coming from a monkey. Quarter million dollars. And nobody can take that money because you cannot prove evolution scientifically. It's impossible. But yet we hear, oh, it's a fact. Is it? You'll see that it's not a fact at all. By the way, I can't prove creation to you either. So if you're here so I can prove creation to you, sorry, I can't. Because again, I can't prove anything that happened in the past because we can't scientifically observe it today. So we're both in the same boat. You can't prove evolution and you can't prove creation. The only difference is this. I have somebody who left me a record telling me what happened. And it's coming from the Bible. That's the record. And that Bible has 25, over 25,000 archaeological sites to support that it is true. That Bible has historical records of people who didn't even believe that Jesus was the Messiah supporting it to be true. That Bible has been proven throughout all of history to be accurate and trustworthy. People say, oh, the Bible's filled with contradictions. Oh, really? Give me one. Because here's the problem. If you think you found a contradiction in the Scripture, I'll tell you this, you just don't know the Scriptures well enough to find the answer yet. I've yet to find a contradiction in the Bible. There are explanations for them. You just haven't studied the Bible well enough to understand it. But like I said, all evidence is going to be interpreted. Carbon-14. You see, we, we use carbon-14 dating and things like that. Carbon-14 is a radioactive element, and it decays. And as it decays, it, it decays at a measurable rate. So it has a half-life of 5,730 years. What that means is half of it will disappear in 5,730 years. Another 5,730 years, half of the half will disappear. In another 5,730 years, half of that goes away. And as you can see, it doesn't take very many 5,700-year cycles until there's no, not enough measurable carbon-14 to date. Well, we believe diamonds form millions of years. It took millions of years for them to form, right? So therefore, there should be no measurable carbon-14 in diamonds anymore. The problem is, when we actually measure the carbon-14 in diamonds, there's a, a plentiful amount of it there. That tells me that their theory is not being supported by observable science. Something's wrong here. But in fact, Carbon dating diamonds dates them to be about 38,000 years old. Now, that's older than the 6,000 years that I believe the Earth is, but there are explanations as to why they're going to give older dates. But we're not going to get into that during this session here for now, but just know that. Comets. Okay, comets, every time they do an orbit near the sun, they start burning up. And that means that they can't orbit the sun very many times before they're gone. This is why even evolutionists say that a comet has a very short lifespan. At best, 100,000 years. Most people even say 10,000 years. So at very best, you could get a comet that would only last 100,000 years. Now here's the problem. We've seen comets. 
If the universe, Earth, is 4.6 billion years old, how come I still see a comet? It should have been gone million, billions of years ago. You see, we both have the same evidence, comets. And evolutionists will look at that same evidence and interpret it with their worldview and say, well, we know the Earth is 4.6 billion years old and there's a, new com there's a comet, it's got to be new. Where did it come from? Well, I don't know, but... There must be some kind of cloud out there called the Oort cloud that these things get knocked into our atmosphere somehow. As a matter of fact, Jan Oort in 1950 proposed that this Oort cloud was out there. 1950. Now the funny thing about it is nobody has seen the Oort cloud. They say this thing is 50,000 astronomical units away. What's an astronomical unit? the distance between the Earth and the Sun, or 93 million miles. Now let me put this in perspective for you. Pluto is 39 astronomical units away. 39. Now what do we know about Pluto? We can't even decide if it's a planet. And yet this Oort cloud is 50,000 astronomical units away. Nobody has ever seen it. Not even the Hubble telescope. Jan Oort himself never saw it. It's a hypothetical cloud that they think has to exist because we see comets. That's their rescue device, and everybody's got one. You see, if it doesn't fit your worldview, what do you do? You come up with some kind of explanation, logical or not, to explain it. And that's what evolution is filled with, these rescuing devices things that don't fit the world view of evolution. And by the way, I've seen Christians do this too. I grew up not knowing whether or not dinosaurs existed. Why? Because my parents didn't know how dinosaurs would fit into the Bible or how the Bible fit into dinosaurs. And so what they told me was, well, maybe they existed, maybe they didn't. We didn't know. They were willing to deny outright evidence of dinosaur bones to keep their world view. So it's not just evolutionists who do this. Everybody can be guilty. But again, what I'm challenging you is, since everybody has a worldview, is to at least have a worldview that will remain consistent. So keep that in mind. The Bible is going to be the foundation for, for my worldview. And I said that before. If the Bible were not proved, man couldn't prove anything. Because it is the only thing that we have that remains consistent historically, archaeologically, scientifically, in every area, it remains consistent. And I don't really like the word prove, but I, I couldn't show you anything without this. Because the reality is this. Why do we have morals? I mean, morality, where does it come from? If evolution is true, you see, your brains had to evolve differently than the brains on the other side of this room, even the brain next to you. Every brain should have evolved, and we should evolve differently on different parts of the earth. So our brains should have come together differently. Yet, do you know that no matter where we go in the world, we have the same moral values? On the other side of the earth, they have the same moral values that we do here. Now, so what does an evolutionist say about this? Since your brain is just chance chemicals and enzymes that have come together, why do we think the same with morality? Well, they'll say it brings the most happiness to the most people. So morality just naturally comes about because it, we just gravitate towards happiness. Well, if that's the case, it would be good, right, and moral for us to get rid of rich people because statistically poor people are happier than rich people. I mean, statistics, that's what they say, so shouldn't we get rid of them? Now, you see, this is just completely inconsistent. Others say, no, 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 no. We get morals because a majority of society agrees upon it for the benefit of society. That's where morals come from. Oh, so Adolf Hitler was a good moral person. Right? He got a number of society to agree what would be best for society is get rid of the weaker links. So he'd be a good moral person according to that definition. Well, obviously that's not a good definition, is it? You see, an evolutionist cannot answer where morals come from. They can't. There is no evolutionary paradigm explanation to explain where morality comes from. 
Yet the Bible does seem to tell us we have morals because as Romans 2.15 says that the requirements of the law have been written on our hearts. God has placed His law on your heart. That's why when you break God's law, you go and steal, you murder somebody, you know automatically that you've done wrong. You see, the Bible gives me an explanation. Evolutionists can't answer it. Now, some will try and say, no, 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 Brian, you're wrong. Morality isn't the same. You go to India, and you know what? They don't eat cows over there. It's immoral to eat cows. And you, you eat, you know, steaks and beef, hamburgers. You have a different moral value. Uh, no, we don't. You see, in India, they don't eat cows because that could be grandma and grandpa. I don't eat grandma and grandpa. The moral value doesn't change. It's just the understanding of why. And so the moral values are the same all over the world. Hebrews 8, it says that I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. Again, the Bible explains why we see these things. And like I said today, you know, animals don't have a conscience. They don't have a spirit. You don't see a cat sitting in the corner saying, I can't believe I killed a mouse. Oh, no. No, it's natural for a cat to kill a mouse. It's just what they do. They don't have those morals. They don't have the law of God written on their hearts. Okay? You see, this is why we cannot argue just the evidence. I could give you, you know, I could stand up here and talk about science till I was blue in the face, but science will never bring anybody to faith. Because science falls short. Only the Word of God, the Spirit of God, can bring people to faith. And that's why I, never, I don't care when I go do a debate, I don't care how public the university is. I will always share the gospel because without it, I have nothing to stand on. The intelligent design movement, I think it's a great stuff. There's some really good stuff in the intelligent design movement, but there is a fault with it. It doesn't go far enough. It's powerless. To say that there has to be a designer, but without telling us that, that, God, that God is that designer, falls short. A worldview safety device that an evolutionist has is what keeps them from allowing them to say, yes, the Bible is true. They can't. Their worldview will not allow it. And so, if I'm going to say, but the Bible says, oh, nope, 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 we're not talking about the Bible. Nope, nope, nope. Science only. Empirical science. That's where we find truth. We can't find it in the Bible. Well, what they're saying is, you can't argue the Bible if people won't accept the Bible. Right? And we fall into this trap many times. Don't argue using the Bible because they don't believe the Bible to be true, so it's a wasted argument. Why not? They use evolution to argue evolution. You know, can you stand on a hill and defend the hill at the same time? Absolutely, and that's what we need to do. And I know this may not make a lot of sense now, but we're going to pull this together to show you that you must use the Bible to argue creation. You must, because if you don't, you will lose. You've lost the debate already. I told you I'm biased. Everybody is. It's just a matter of which bias is the best bias to which to be biased with. And my bias is the scriptures. We have so many laws of nature that are wonderful to look at. Now, kids, you listen up here, okay? I'm going to teach you to make something very powerful here. Thermite. Okay, thermite can burn so hot that if you would take a spoonful of thermite and stick it on the hood of your mom and dad's car and light it, it would melt a hole through the hood of the car, even through the engine block. It burns that hot. And I'm going to tell you how to make it. <laughs> All you need is rust. Get some iron, you know, rusty nails. Just get the rust off of there. And then some aluminum filings. Like here's some aluminum foil. Aluminum and rust makes thermite. I know what you're going to be doing 4th of July. I know your parents are thinking, are you that brain dead? What are you doing? Well, I feel safe telling you how to make thermite because I know you won't be able to get it lit. You can take a torch to that and you still won't get it to light. 
it takes extreme temperatures to get it to light. So you can make it, but you won't be able to use it. But I have here a rusty old steel ball. Another one here. And all I did is I put a little piece of tin foil over it. So I have rust and aluminum, iron and aluminum. In essence, thermite. Well, there's a law of friction. Friction allows me to walk across this room, pushing off. And it can get very hot. If you rub your hands together really quick, you get warm hands, right? That's friction. If I put these together, it's going to get really hot. That's friction. I just lit thermite. Because I can get temperatures of 25,000 degrees to go with that. And that's all it is. This is a law of science. Now this works whether I go to Africa or India or here in the United States. The same law works. Works all the time. Okay? Just thermite. That law is consistent. Now, there are other laws that we can look at. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these air zookas. We have what, what's called a toroidal vortice here. Now, these air zookas will take a circle of air and I can shoot it across the room. I can shoot you guys. Okay? You can see people jumping and their hair moving. Uh, obviously won't be able to shoot all of you here, but a few of you. Now, you can see that there are, I'm shooting this quite a ways. I can shoot people way in the back of the room even. Okay? You know something is happening because I'm seeing shirts going and hair going and people going, but you can't see what's happening, can you? But you can feel it. Something's going on, but we don't know what it is. Well, it's a law of science. My aim's off. There we go. It's a toroidal vortice. Now, I thought, well, maybe it's just not big enough for us to see it. We just can't see it because it's too small. So we thought, why not supersize it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Same effect. Yeah, see? Same effect, but even supersizing this thing, I can't, I can't see what's going on. So we had this idea, well, maybe what we need to do is, this is still kind of warming up, we're going to take some fog from a fogger here, and we're going to fill it with smoke, artificial smoke, you know, fogger. Now, this is kind of the way it is in this world, guys. We're living in this world and there are things going on all around us. But we can't see it. We can't understand it. We don't know what's happening because we're not filled with something. And what we're going to do is fill this, which is going to be kind of a representation of the Holy Spirit. Now, while that warms up, I'm going to show you one more thing and I'll come back to that. Here's another law. Have a bag here. And let's see, do I have some young kid here that feels... You want to see how much air you have in your lungs? Who'd like to do this? Just, I need a volunteer. How about you? Can you do this? Yeah, come up right over here to the bottom. We're going to see uh, you know, how much air he has in his lungs. We're going to see how manly he is here, okay? So you just take and go, just a deep breath. Blow into that bag as much air as you can get, okay? And we'll see how manly he is. All right. This is about how much air. That's how much of a man he is right there, Okay. Don't worry, you're growing up. Someday you can be a man like me. You see, I'm going to take this and I'm going to show you what I can do. Thank you. This is called Bernoulli's principle. You see, I cheated because only a little bit of that came out of my mouth. Most of it was the air in this room because I created a low pressure going into this bag so it was sucking air from inside the room around the bag to go into it. Whoops, I let a little hole in there so I didn't get it as big. 